However, there are going to be 5 to 10 percent of our students who aren't going to pick it up that way. And they will need to be uh, given some interventions in that tier two, which is the yellow tier there. And they are going to get a more targeted intervention, probably in a smaller group, research-based intervention on top of their core curriculum to help support that and give them that little extra boost. And then there's about 1 to 5% of our population that are going to need even more than that. And that's that very tip of the pyramid, the red intensive tier three group, okay? Once a student has kind of gone through all of those three tiers, then and only then do we take a look at special education. If the student has progressed, but it has taken a tier three kind of intensive program to have that happen, it may be that they need to continue to have that intense a level and we find them eligible for special education. If they have not progressed, Despite all of that intensive intervention, then we would assess to determine if there's a special education learning disability. So both sides of that. Notice that there are two sides. There's your behavior side, and there's the academic side. So we have students that have the ability and can learn the academics, but because of social and emotional kinds of issues, they may be having difficulty. We need to address those just as much as we need to address learning um, skills, reading abilities, etc. So what's the difference between the tiers? This will help you kind of understand that. If we take a look at the time we spend on curriculum, a tier one, if we're looking at reading, we might spend about 90 minutes on reading in tier one. We might spend 120 minutes in tier two, and we might spend 180 minutes in tier three. Intensive, it gets more intensive as you go up the tiers. The curricular focus. If tier one, the basic curriculum is five areas, tier two might be less than five, but more intensively in the ones that we do address. And tier three might be really focusing in on two or less, but really intensely looking at those areas because those are the areas of deficit. The curricular breadth of the curriculum. We have our core curriculum. Uh, reading language arts, as you said, is packed with content that we need to be covering. And so that's the core uh, breadth in Tier 1. In Tier 2, we want to cover that core, but we want to give them supplemental supports to help them understand that core um, so that it helps their learning. And in Tier 3, we're going to do core and supplemental and some intensive on top of that. So that falls in line with giving them more time as well. And then frequency of progress monitoring. And progress monitoring is making sure that learning is occurring. One of my favorite cartoons is a little boy and he's got a little dog. And a friend of his comes along and says, what are you doing? Well, I taught Spot how to whistle. So the friend leans over and looks at the dog and listens and silent. Turns to him and says, I don't hear him whistling. Well, I said I taught him, I didn't say he learned it. We need to know all along the way that what we're teaching is being learned. And so we give frequent progress monitoring to make sure that the students are learning what we're teaching. So tier one, we have our grand star testing that's given once a year and then obviously teachers give formative and summative assessments along the way. With tier two, we want to be monitoring monthly to see if that additional supplementary intervention is working in the area that we're focusing on. And in tier three, because it's very intensive, we want to be progress monitoring on a weekly basis, if not uh, more often than that. So one of the big key pieces of RTI is that we're not just pulling ideas out of the air. We are using data to determine and make those decisions. Universal screening is a screening that is done school-wide or department-wide to determine if students are learning and to identify students in need of learning support. And so we use universal screening and then we use more frequent progress monitoring to make sure that students are in fact, in fact learning to whistle. So this is a sample of a universal screening for um, all third graders at XYZ elementary school. And what we're measuring is correct words read, okay? So if you take a look at this, what does that tell you? Are most of the students learning? 
the core? Yes, we've got some accelerated learners. We've got very basic, they're learning what we're, we're teaching them. And then we've got um, one or two students over there in the red that we need to be looking at and be concerned about. So that's our broad screening. Now we can focus in on the students in that red bar. And so it goes to our professional learning team, or RTI team, and they take a look at it in terms of a continuous improvement cycle. So we assess the needs at the top, we plan the intervention, we implement the intervention, and then we evaluate frequently whether it's working or not, and then we go back up and we continue in that cycle, okay? So progress monitoring, we move into a tier two intervention for a student. We're using frequent progress monitoring, uh, curriculum-based measurements. Uh, the progress is reviewed by our RTI team and they're using that data to make decisions. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. These students are not LVUSD students. I think they're cyber students or whatever, but let's take a look at Egbert, okay? We have our current status, we did an assessment, we found that in terms of correct words per minute, our class average was 24 and Egbert, Egbert was down at 11. So he was one of those red students that we need to take a look at. Our class growth we're projecting will go along the blue line. Egbert, we'd like to have him catch up with the class average. So we chart a goal line for Egbert and that's the yellow line. And so we start working with Egbert, and the red uh, indicates his progress monitoring. And Egbert does pretty well week one and week two, kind of the honeymoon period. Week three, starting to slip a little bit, and week four looks like maybe we've got a problem. And so our team takes a look at that data, and they decide, let's tweak that intervention a little bit, tweak being an educational term. And we change the intervention a little bit and we watch Egbert's line and you can see that it starts to increase significantly. Aha, we got the right match and Egbert in fact exceeds his goal line on his rocketing way to catching up to the class. And so we change his goal line and he not only catches up with the class, he exceeds the class in the end. And so our PLC celebrates, okay? So that's the success of Egbert. Let's take a look at Egberta. Okay, same class, Egberta is achieving the same actually as Egbert did. We set Egberta's line, uh, her goal line, and she starts chugging along and starts to dip a little bit. So back comes our PLC team making those fabulous decisions and they start to watch and she starts to improve a little bit but then starts to dip again a little bit. So our team looks at that data again. There they are, same suit, same tie, but I think it's a different day. And they change the intervention and say, let's tweak that one more time. And so they tweak it and she charts along but doesn't quite do the rocket progress that Egbert did, but she does make progress, doesn't she? We know, though, that she's continuing to need intensive tier three intervention to make that progress. And so at that point, we probably do do a special ed referral. Even though she's making progress, we want to make sure she continues that progress. And so she may continue to get some specialized intervention on top of what she's getting. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of what RTI is doing. Uh, what interventions are we using? They are research-based interventions. They are applied with fidelity to their design. So when Russ does I Can Learn, he doesn't just decide one morning how to do it. He did read the manual. He did follow, right? <laughs> I'm looking for a handshake. Um, that, <laughs> that, they, that they are implementing it the way it was designed and the way the research was done. Uh, so that's fidelity to the design of the program and that the interventions address the specific problem or area of need. Egberta was having difficulty with word recognition and correct word reading. If we put her in a math intervention group, that probably was, is not going to improve her reading skills. 
So how do we do all of that? I know you're thinking that. When do you find the time in the day? How do you, the budget is horrible. How do we do that? Um, we maximize our human resources at a school. We create schedules that allow some grouping to address the needs of all students, and I'll give you some examples of those. We use larger groups for the core and extended learning and smaller uh, intensive groups for tier two and tier three interventions. So here's an example, and this is not a specific school. It is a model that might be very similar to the schools. And that is that the school has from 9 to 10.30, we have walk to learn time, which means everyone gets up and they walk to their particular group based upon how they're learning and what tier they're in. So let's say we have six classes of second and third grades. Um, so that's six teachers plus whatever instructional assistants we have plus whatever special ed staff might be running a similar kind of group plus whatever volunteers may, we might have. We have small intensive intervention groups. We have larger core activity groups. We have extended activity groups running with all of our human resources that we are putting into place. Because we blocked out between 9 and 10.30, it allows us maximum flexibility that that's what we're doing. I've been going out to all of our schools looking at the models, and there are some dynamite things happening with this type of a model. Secondary examples, we have targeted interventions for students who are identified through the DNF list. So they are meeting with their counselors, meeting with their administrators, looking at what we can do to intervene. RTI classes for targeted instruction in addition to the core classes. Uh, before and after school learn tutorial programs, specialized support during support period, specialized support during sustained silent reading time. The I Can Learn um, math class is a, is a great example of a fabulous intervention that's going on. So where is Las Virginis in this whole um, scheme of RTI? All of our schools are in the process of developing and implementing RTI programs and schedules. We began at the elementary level, makes sense, right? Catch them when they're young, early intervention, so that hopefully by the time they get to you guys at high school, we fixed all the problems. Um, we're, so we're beginning early, but it is at all schools. All schools are sending teams to county trainings by nationally recognized experts. Ventura County has brought in some fabulous speakers for that. Um, RTI is in line with the board dynamics and focus areas. Um, our students already rank high in state and national achievement. I, I know you know that. Um, this is a tool that will assist all of our students to achieve their potential. So we're here to talk to you all today about what we're doing at Mondero Canyon in regards to collaboration. What Mary just brought up was PLCs and RTI, and PLCs, Professional Learning Communities, is exactly what we're doing at a grade level at Lindero Canyon. We're meeting as seventh grade social science teachers, both the gate and regular education, to collaborate and create curriculum together in order to best serve our students in the richest way possible with the limited amount of time that we have with them.